we've been talking about this great prophecy and promise of Acts 1-8, you shall be my witnesses. We've been talking about the fact that we will be resisted in this commitment to be Christ's witnesses. The world, the flesh, and the devil will say, you shall not be his witnesses. You shall not witness for him. Here's the question, how does Christ know we'll be his witnesses? Or where does he get the authority to command us to be his witnesses? John chapter 1, Jesus proves his authority to Nathanael by saying to him, before Philip came to you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. John 1, 48. He saw Nathanael under the tree, even though he wasn't there. In Luke 5 that we've been talking about, when the disciples have been out catching nothing all night, he says in Luke 5, 4, let down your nets. They let down their nets and they caught a great quantity of fish. So we see in John 1, that he sees under the trees. We see in Luke 5 that he sees under the seas. He saw Nathanael under the tree. He saw the fish under the, under the sea. He wasn't under the tree, but he could see under the tree. He wasn't under the sea, but he could see under the sea. He says in Luke 10, this very uh, mysterious verse, Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan falling from heaven. He sees invisible spirits in, in distant places. He says to Nathaniel in the last verse of John 1, John 1, 51, You shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So he also sees the things which haven't happened yet. Because he sees everything. Because he's the Son of God. And what he says to us is, you shall be my witnesses. And he has authority to say that to us, and we have the responsibility to aim all of our lives toward that because we are owned by him. We are twice his. First by creation, he made us. Then by redemption, he saved us. He sustains us, that is, he keeps us going. We live moment by moment because He allows us to live. As a matter of fact, I would encourage you to thank God every day that you're still alive. To get up in the morning and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you allowed me to live until 9 September 2010. You know what? He even thought of us before there was any human being made. He conceptualized us, he imagined us, and then he made us and, and he sustained us. So the psalmist says in Psalm 100, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 verse 3, we are his people, Psalm 100, we shall be his witnesses, Acts 1.8. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 5, turn to it very quickly. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. This is one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible in terms of, especially in terms of telling us how we ought to think about our own lives. And how do we think of our lives? We think about our life in terms of Christ's death. That's the key. You want to understand your life? You have to study Christ's death. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15 says this, He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. This is one of the most wonderful things we can ever think about, that we don't have to live for ourselves. Have you ever been around somebody who lives for themselves? They are boring. They are discouraging. They are disgusting. They are pathetic. 
because they're only living for themselves. That's an ugly thing. Have you ever been around somebody who lives for Christ? They are interesting. They are inspiring. They are noble because that's a beautiful thing to live for Christ, to be His witnesses. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, He died for all so that they who live, that's us, might no longer have to live for themselves. We don't have to live for, for ourselves because Christ died for ourselves. He died for us so that we wouldn't have to live for us, but that we might live for Him who died and rose again on our behalf, rose again for us. Okay, now let's think about Acts 1.8. I was born in the state of Georgia, in the city of Atlanta, the same place Coca-Cola was born. Not anything to be proud of. And I love Atlanta. I love Atlanta. I love being there. And for the first 25 years of my life, I was a baby. I couldn't stand to be away from Atlanta. I moved 60 miles away to go to university, but I came home way too much because I was a baby. I didn't want to be away from Atlanta. And then I moved almost a thousand miles away to Dallas to go to graduate school. I came home way too much because I was a baby, because I couldn't stand to be away from Atlanta. And then one day God changed me. And it was no longer important to be near Atlanta. What became important was to be a witness. Not only in Atlanta, not only in Georgia, not only in the United States, but in the uttermost part of the world. When I was a baby, I feared that one day I might have to leave Atlanta. Now that I'm no longer a baby, I fear that one day God may make me move back to America. I don't want to live in America because there are many, many witnesses there. I want to go to places where there are few witnesses, and I want to be a witness because Christ has changed me. He's changed me in that way. Now, very soon after I decided I'm not going to live in America anymore, many people said to me, but we need witnesses here. There's so much work to do in our country. There's so many people who don't believe the gospel in America. That's true, but it's not because they can't hear the gospel. It's not because the gospel is nowhere to be found. But you will always find somebody who'll tell you there's work to be done right here. Here's the thing. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part. Now, the work was not finished in Jerusalem until they went to Samaria. The work was not finished in Samaria before they went to the uttermost part. If they waited until the work was finished in Jerusalem, there would have never been missions, and the Gentiles would have never become Christians because the work is still not over in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is full of unbelievers, and the Jews have resisted the gospel as strongly as anyone has resisted the gospel. So. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria still need lots of work. We don't say, oh, we've got to finish the job in Jerusalem and Judea 
and Samaria before we can go to the uttermost part of the world. No, 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 no. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the world. Now, here's our choice. Our choice is not between going or staying. If you're a Christian, you are responsible for the Great Commission. You are responsible for the last things that Jesus said. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you are responsible for Acts 1a. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Those verses are for you. They're not for missionaries. They're not for preachers. They're not, they're not for somebody else. They're for you and they're for me. Now, here's the question. So what is our choice? Our choice is not between going or staying. Our choice, because we are world Christians and because we are under the authority of the Holy Spirit, our choice is between going or sending. Your choice is not between going and staying. Your choice is between going and staying. Maybe you'll never leave Kursk. Maybe you'll never leave Russia, but you will play a part. You will send. You will send. Paul says in Romans 10, nobody can go unless somebody sends them. William Carey, the great founder of modern missions, at least in the English-speaking world, William Carey said, I will go down into the pit. I'll go down into the, into the hole. He went to India. He said, I'll go down into that deep black hole if you will hold the rope. If William Carey's going to go down into the great hole of India, somebody's got to hold the rope for him and he's holding onto the rope. In other words, somebody's got to send him. So the way we participate in Acts 1-8, the, um, the way we obey that verse may not be going ourselves, but it may be sending. We don't say, well, I can't go, so I guess I'll stay. We say, well, you know, I don't think I can go. I don't think I'm called to go. I think I'm supposed to be here. So that means I'm going to send. I'm going to be involved in sending, even though I can't go myself. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amounts, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Before we leave this passage, I want to just say two or three things about the kind of resistance you will face. What will stop you from, be, from um, being a witness? How will you be resisted? You need to understand that the resistance against our witness come from a defeated but powerful spiritual enemy. You need to remember two things about him. He is powerful, but he's also defeated. I'm talking about the devil. You and I do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. Jesus has already won the victory. Our enemy is defeated. You know, when, when my daughter was young, we used to live on the seacoast in North Carolina, and I took her to the beach with one of her friends. And what we call a stingray had floated up on the beach, and it was dead. And she and her little friend, they were about 10 years old. They talked me, I don't know how they did it, but they talked me into taking this thing home with us. 
So I was going to put it in the trunk of a car, our car and take it home. And I made this little thing with sticks to pick it up. Well, when I pick it, picked it up, it touched me. It hit me on the left arm. And it stung. It hurt me badly. It hurt me so badly and the pain started up my arm. And the pain kept going over hours and the pain went into my shoulder. And then the, the pain started to my chest. And when the pain started into my chest, I went to the hospital because I was afraid. The stingray was dead, but it still stung me. It still hurt me. It still gave me pain. Now the devil is dead. He's, well, he's not dead, but he's defeated. He's beaten. Christ has won the battle, but he can still hurt us if we're not careful. He can still cause us pain if we don't know what we're doing. So we have to understand. Now, our resources are sufficient. Our resources are powerful. Our resources are spiritual. The resistance to our witness will come from basically three different directions. One, the idolatry of nature. The idolatry of nature. This comes from two different areas very primitive people who worship nature and who make idols and very sophisticated people who are scientists and who also make an idol out of nature. One week ago, Stephen Hawking, the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge, said that gravity has created the universe. We don't need God because we've got gravity. Now that's absolutely absurd absolutely absurd. Romans 1 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. But this is one source of our resistance, the idolatry of nature. We bow down to nature instead of bowing down to God. The idea that matter is, is self-existent. Then there's the idolatry of man. Humanism saying that man is so highly developed, man is so intelligent, man is so cultured, man is so educated, and man has made these discoveries on his own that he doesn't need God. He can be happy without God. He can be moral without God. He can be fulfilled without God. And he can be um, a God to himself. And the third source is false religion. The first two are really false religion, but they are disguised. They're really all false religions, but some false religion is undisguised, and there are many examples of this. Islam is the main example of this, but there's also the cults. There's also Hinduism. There's also Buddhism. I got to know a Buddhist at the train station in Budapest three weeks ago from, from Prague, so committed to Buddhism that he had learned the Tibetan language amazingly committed person. So there's the resistance. He was resisting my witness because he believed in a false religion. Now, um, we are to move through this resistance and to be Christ's witnesses because Christ has gone back to the Father. And we are his physical, we are, the proof, we are the physical proof of his spiritual power by our physical presence on this, on this planet. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109, 
0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.